Okay, so we're four minutes in. Anyone else, you know, that joins, the meeting is recorded and, you know, I think we can just push it to them. So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Onini. You are welcome to the fourth edition of the Abuja Literary and Arts Festival. Um, the theme of this year is making art work. And after a week long series of activities, workshops, plays, and all things, you know, celebrating art, basically, we are on the last day. And this is, you know, the second to the last panel on the last day. Sorry. On the last day, talking about a tale of African novels and their publishers. Um, we have two panelists, Sawad Hussein and Mr. Nana Aweri Damoa. Welcome. And our moderator for today is Mr. Suedi Agema. You're welcome. We're very glad to have you and we're very excited to see how you know, this is going to go. So I'm going to hand over to the moderator. And yes, I think we can kick off. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Hi Nana and uh, <laughs> everybody else. Uh, I think there are just about 10 of us. So uh, I think it's easy to just beat everybody. Hi, Chris. Hi, Farida. Hi, Gib. <laughs> Hi, Sanuki. And of course, Onyinye. Nice to have all of us here. Hello. <laughs> OK, yeah, hopes to be really good. Um, nice to meet you. I'm not sure I've met us before. So this is really a really uh, nice time. I'm using two screens, so sorry. If you see my eyes darting around, I'm just trying to <laughs> in case I lose connectivity or ah, one of them. Okay. Yeah, because you can never trust these things. Okay, so um, by manner of introduction, uh, what we are trying to do here, you know, is basically talk about the African novel, which mm. we all love so much. The African novel that has become the pride of the continent and has done so much for us in the literary sphere. The African novel that has given us Chimamanda, has given us, well, talking of our contemporary folks now, therefore, to use the older ones, has given us the Ngugis, the Achebes. So that's what we're going to be discussing. But um, we're going to be a bit more practical. We're going to be discussing our, uh, our view of the novel. Um, how it sells, what is happening about it. Okay, somebody's saying, I probably shouldn't be looking at the chat box at the moment. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, all right. That was a bit confusing, but uh, yeah. So we'll also be talking about publishing because we have Nana here. Nana is the distinguished publisher a uh, bookseller, one of the biggest booksellers in Ghana. And we'll be talking about translating because we have the multiple award-winning Sawad here who has written, who has translated works that are award-winning and herself has won awards. But to start, I think it's only best to just read out the uh, bios of the panelists here so that we have a fair idea of the people we are talking to. Um, so I'll start with Sawad. Uh, Sawad is an Arabic translator and literate who is passionate about bringing narratives from the African continent to wider audiences. She was co-editor of the Arabic English portion of the award-winning Oxford Arabic Dictionary in 2014. Her translations have been recognized by the English Pen, the Anglo-Omani Society and the Palestine Book Awards, among several others. She has run workshops introducing translation to students and adults under the auspices of Shadow Heroes in the UK, right? Yes. Right. Uh, Africa Rights <laughs> and Shibak Festival. Her latest translation is a Libyan short story collection by Najwa Bin Shatwan. Did I get that right? Yes, yeah. 
Right, she holds um, an MA in Modern Arabic Literature from the School of Oriental and African Studies, that's the University of London. Right, and her Twitter handle is at Stawad Hussein, really lovely handle, she's active on it. And um, I was <laughs> on it just a few seconds ago, really interesting stuff going on there. Oh yeah, um, Twitter is banned in Nigeria, so how was I? Oh yeah, I'm in the UK, yes, that's how I was able to do that. <laughs> So, um, Nana. Nana is a publisher, a bookseller, technical service consultant. He is a distinguished evening um, alumni, yes, with a science background, chemical engineer, yes. And um, he runs, he's a co founder of Book Nook Store, an online bookshop focused on distributing printed African books across the world. So he has a good knowledge of um, African books and sales. He's also the co-founder of Diak Fabli, maybe you'd pronounce that later, an associate, a publishing house that operates out of Ghana. In 1997, Nana won first prize in the Step Magazine National Writing Competition. In 2017, his story, October Rush, won first prize in the Amateido Story category of the GAW Awards. He's the author of eight books, including Sabbaticals Chapter X, and Sepisms, Sabbatically <laughs> Speaking, I Speak of Ghana, um, I think I Speak of Ghana is um, nonfiction, Tales from Different Tales, Through the Gates of Thought, and Exc Excursions in My Mind. Nana holds a master's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Nottingham and a bachelor's in chemical engineering from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, as well as a postgraduate diploma in supply chain and operations from the University of Liverpool. He is married with three children and is based in Tema, Ghana. So uh, very nice to meet both of you, Sawad and Nana. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just okay. to confirm, sorry, my name is pronounced with a V, so Savad. Oh. Yes. Right, Savad. <laughs> no my worries bad. at all. I just, Savad. I'm never sure like when to say this. So I thought I was like, let me just say it now. Yeah. Okay. I guess the next time I'm doing, uh, moderating any panel, I'll start by asking the panelists to introduce <laughs> themselves. So saves everybody a lot of trouble. <laughs> Thanks. Are you okay with being Nana? Yes, it's fine. Yes. Nana oh, is okay. Easy. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think uh, it's just better for us to start with this question. Um, what's the African novel and what's our view of it? You know, so let's start with Savard. Mm -hmm. So what is the African novel? Um, for me, primarily because I'm working with Arabophone countries, um, you know, which is what I'm going to talk about here today is when I'm thinking about the African novel I'm thinking of I mean although I read a, a you know a lot of African literature written in English or translated from French um, but for me when I'm thinking about the African novel as a translator and when I'm scouting books to see you know what I can bring into English I'm looking at books from Libya from Eritrea from Mauritania which are all works that I'm currently working on or have published simply because I find that there's been historically like a greater emphasis put on works from the Maghreb, so from Morocco, Algeria, and also Egypt. So for me, like a lot of the times, the countries I'm trying to bring the narratives over from are overlooked both, you know, by, unfortunately, by Arabic publishing as well as African publishing. So um, the writers that I'm working with a lot of the times are publishing their works outside of their countries with the exception of Stella Gatano, who is a South Sudanese writer I'm working with. I spoke to her yesterday and she was one of the few writers who I work with who said she's happy with the publishing scene in South Sudan, actually, and they've been very supportive of her, as opposed to Najwa bin Shatwan, who's Libyan, and for example, um, Ahad, Ahmed Isanu, who's from Mauritania. Both of them ha are no longer living in their countries, but even when, when they were there, they published their books either in um, Lebanon, um, or the Emirates, which is now, you know, a stalwart of publishing in, in the Arab sphere. And so for me, like, I guess, I, you know, it's a very broad question. So I'm just taking it where I'm seeing fit. Yeah. Is, uh, 
it's kind of, I find like there's certain countries which are seen as, yes, this is African enough and this is our African novel and we'll celebrate it. And there's other countries which are considered perhaps not African enough and they're seen to be more orient, you know, oriented towards the Middle East, but then the Middle East also doesn't claim them as their own. So then these countries just kind of fall in between, like, you know, such as the authors that I'm working with. And it's something that frustrates them because you know, they also want to have their stories heard and narratives celebrated and feted. But even, you know, for things such as marketing, when you're bringing these books into English, um, a lot of times publishers are a bit stumped, like, oh, how are we going to market this? Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there, but I'm curious to hear uh, what Nana thinks. Okay, that makes a whole lot of sense. It's interesting that you would say this because we don't really get to hear much of the Maghreb aspect of literature, you know, especially on our continent, uh, which I think we'll need to discuss a bit more on as we move on. But uh, let's get to you, Nana. Same question. Uh, what's your view of the African novel? And uh, drawing from what she has said, do you think uh, the African novel um, from the other parts of Africa has more presence, more recognition, and more acceptance on the continent? So um, good afternoon, everyone. I guess I need to ask you also how we address you. How do we call you? Oh, Swedi is fine, or you can call Swedi. me too, whatever you prefer. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, yeah, that's perfect. Um, you know, personally, I'm uncomfortable with labels because I feel that labels and classifications tend to, first of all, put us in silos, which is really uh, not something I, I, I prefer to do as a creative because creatives don't really work well within, within silos and they don't work well within boundaries. And once we, actually what is creativity? Creativity is actually breaking the boundaries, you know? So let, let me just put that out there, uh, first of all. But when you talk about African novel, I, I look at three uh, classifications, uh, if you like. First of all, novels written by Africans living in Africa. So there, um, with, with what Savas said, I don't really have a problem with either whether you are sitting in the intercession between <laughs> between uh, the, the Northern Africa and the, uh, um, the, the, the Arab, Arabic um, world or, or, or not. Because really, before all of these uh, colonial things, we were really very fluid and moving uh, in between all of these areas. But that's the first one, a, a, a novel written by an African uh, living in Africa. Secondly, a novel written by an African in the diaspora, because that's also a very important aspect of the, the African uh, novel. The third point would be novels written by Africans of uh, people of African descent. And once you do that, then you are actually veering even into, into the areas of black uh, authors, you know. And then the fourth one, which for me might be, for many might be problematic, but which is really important. And I'll give you an example. If you look at the historical books of, of, our, of our, what we call historical books about Africa now, um, of um, uh, pre-colonial times, like the Ashanti um, history, one of them, one of the most important guys who wrote is called Ivor, Ivor Wilkes. And Ivor is a, is a British guy who spent a lot of time in Ghana. And one of, some of his books are the, the authoritative books of those periods. So do you call those books African books? Because these are non-Africans who lived in Africa almost all their lives and wrote a lot uh, about, about Africa and actually have documented, we actually without them, we might have lost some of the, the, the aspects of our, of our history. So these are the four broad categories that I would, I would say uh, would encompass uh, African novels. You are muted, Sweddy. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know. Uh, I kept no, on it's okay. <laughs> ah, technology. I'll <laughs> throw you used to it eventually. Yeah, so um, the other thing that, uh, that you didn't mention, you know, the second part of the question was, what's the reception? Because what Stavard has said, is that um, most of the people she has worked with, they actually had to reach outward, that's go out of their writing, out of their national sphere to get published, um, except the South Sudanese author. So yes. what's your experience like 
you know, so that we can create that boundary so that we can compare between both sides to know what's happening generally. Well, I, I think uh, when I, where I sit now, especially in contemporary times, we are having a, a great um, sort of activity of um, African publishers publishing um, Africans or publishing uh, Afri African novels now. Mm. Um, clearly, in the if if you take the the forties to perhaps the the sixties, uh, most most publishing was was um, taking place outside the continent. Um, after the after independence and in the in the great wave of nationalism and uh, independence uh, between the sixties and say the eighties, we had a lot of uh, uh, Pan African uh, publishing. But um, if you see historically from the 80s or the mid 70s to perhaps the, the mid 90s in, in terms of the economic um, upheavals that we have in most uh, African countries, uh, we had a lot of, and then also people starting to travel abroad, um, second generation Africans, we had a lot of publishing happening uh, outside. So then we had the Chimamandas and all of those coming up. But if you would see, even for big names like Chimamanda, now they are looking back into Africa and looking for African uh, publishers to, to take rights of their books and publish. Because what happens is that those who got published outside, and I think you will come to that eventually, those who got published big time abroad in Europe and in Americas, these publishers are not really interested in Africa as, as a market, you know. So if you want, if you are a big public, uh, writer, author out there, Either you try to get uh, African publishers to get your rights to, to publish them and distribute them across the continent, or you find a way to get the physical books to bring back to your countries to have them distributed. You know, So we are having a mix, but it's exciting to see authors wherever they are, either in Africa or outside Africa, or even within Africa, in, in, um, intra-Africa, beginning to become interested in seeing a Nigerian or a book uh, getting uh, distributed, say, in, uh, in, in, um, in Egypt, or a book from South Sudan, uh, people wondering how they can get them in Liberia, you know. So that's, that's, the, that's what's happening within the sphere now, and it is, it is quite exciting. And for instance, I, a quick one, I mean, I have some people who ask me for books from um, Northern Africa, because they want they, I mean, when they come to my bookstore, they want to get books from from that side of the of the continent to also uh, uh, learn about their experiences. Yeah. Okay, uh, so just to stick with you again, drawing on from what you just mentioned, uh, you mentioned now that most of the publishing houses abroad would not they don't to paraphrase you now they don't really have the interest of the yes. uh, authors. At heart, but don't you think it's a paradox that many times most um, authors have to be canonized outside? You know, they have the West has to um, say oh, you're good before they're accepted back. Why is it usually like that? Why do we have to um, take from these people who are, have been venerated outside? No, okay. So a quick, a quick correction. I didn't say they didn't have the author's um, interest at heart. I said. The Africa as a continent, as a market, is not something that interests them uh, oh, yeah. that much. It, it, it all comes down to economics. I mean, if you look at where your sales are coming from, you 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 would uh, you would focus. Yeah, but really, it is uh, so. It is it is the the issue of um, where going where um, you can you can be accepted, you can be promoted, and then you can be made big. You know, and um, I mean, unfortunately, or fortunately, that's what is what is uh, on the ground. I mean, if I'm an author, and I I, I get I get um, like a six figure sort of approach <laughs> to have my book uh, published and made big, obviously I I would take it. But the good thing I'm saying is that even and it is important for us not. That's why the, the those classifications bother me sometimes. So it does it shouldn't matter wherever the person has been accepted or has been promoted we should accept the people back as our own because they are our own and find ways to get their books onto the continent and read by, by us, okay? Again, if we are able to do that and we are able to get a, a lot of uh, interest in that, I think these publishers then will become interested 
in Africa as a continent. And finally, they can begin to look at stories that appeal to Africans. Because sometimes most of these stories, you realize that there is a slant, there is a theme which we sells much better. Because, but unless they see Africa as an interesting place where our interest in the, the, the appetite for certain stories uh, um, goes and become commercial, we will not be, we will com continue complaining that some of these stories uh, really have a, a particular image about Africa before itself. And panda to the West, more or less, poverty exactly. born and things of the sort. Okay, we will still return to this, but uh, Savad, to uh, focus on what you had mentioned earlier, you know, back on what you said about most of the authors publishing outside. Uh, can you just speak a bit more about that experience? Uh, you know, just tell us a bit more about the people who you've worked with, um, why perhaps you think that they don't really have publishers within their countries um, wanting to publish their works and why they have to reach out more. Yeah, definitely. I also have some questions for Nana, so, but I don't know, should I ask now or leave that for later? uh well let's as soon as you're done with your uh with the response then you can uh, okay the question. <laughs> so this is more like an interactive session so, between yeah. us okay so it's fine great um so yeah so if we're you know for example Najwa bin Shatwan, uh as i mentioned who is a libyan author was forced to publish her works outside of the country primarily due to censorship under gaddafi's regime but even afterwards, you know, after, uh, you know, Gaddafi was no longer in power, um, it's still very much, you know, the, there is an infrastructure there, but they're only mm -hmm. publishing specific sort of narratives, which again are glorifying whichever power is, you know, um, in control at the time. Um, she actually was put in jail for, it was during, um, Gaddafi's rule when she had published a story on the internet when um, the internet had first made a foray into Libya and Gaddafi was saying that you know look how like liberal we are we have like the internet and we're open-minded and so she had published this short story which was making fun of uh, the military and also like you know the regime um, and so that they immediately picked her up and, 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 and interrogated her and she was a university professor at the time and they said well you need to write stories that uh, you know um, sing our praises, not doing what you're actually doing. So she ended up having to leave the country and she's been living in Italy for, you know, a very long time now. So, um, but what's interesting with her is when I was speaking to her earlier today, she told me that even though she is publishing in Lebanon and, you know, um, the Emirates, specifically her experience in, in Lebanon and Egypt, she's had to pay to get her books published, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I don't know what, the, what, what I would love to hear, you know, from Nana if he's heard about authors having to do that. But I was just shocked, like the authors are having to pay to get their books published um, and then also like pay additional, you know, um, amounts if they want their books uh, featured at uh, book fairs, you know. Um, and so that was quite uh, disturbing for me. And then also um, with regards to Ahmed Islamu, who now is based in Qatar, who is Mauritanian, he was saying in his point of view, there's no actual, he said, um, publishing house, which is operating to professional standards in Mauritania. So he's published all of his books in the Gulf. Uh, and finally, uh, as I said, Stella Gatano said that, you know, she's very happy with her publisher and they've, you know, when they can, so she's in South Sudan, have um, featured her book at different book fairs and festivals. But the issue there is the funding, right? Like in terms of and distribution. So, you know, I, the only way I was able to get her book uh, was she had to mail it to me uh, as in like send me a PDF because it, it's not a it's not a question of, you know, oh, like how good is her writing and why isn't it traveling? It's not traveling because of the, the distribution's not there. Um, and so she just told me earlier today, she's really excited to have her book translated into English, specifically published in Europe so that more people can actually buy it and read it in South Sudan. D do you see what I'm saying? It's so ridiculous that it, we're going around in these circles so people can actually get the book that she wrote in the country where they are already. Mm. Um, so there's that but uh yeah i think i mean i've forgotten your original question now <laughs> <laughs> i think you've actually answered it uh i think the key thing you've mentioned is the main reason why most people have to look outward is one because of censorship 
maybe mm -hmm. government censorship and stuff like that. Then number two, also because um, lack of because infrastructure. They are in proper houses. Yeah, proper yeah. houses. Yeah. So there's a lack of, mm -hmm. which is interesting because. Uh, or oh, Nana, would you like to add something to that? Because I think she had. No. Uh, but, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you mentioned issues of distribution too, which is interesting because in several parts of of Africa, a uh, part of Africa, um, I'm sure Nana would be able to attest to this. We have these issues of the same distribution, and it's very common to have people pay to have their work published. Um, self-publishing, okay. independent publishing. And then if you're lucky enough, it wins an award or something, and then people get to take more cognizance of you. But um, Nana, would you just like to add in on your experiences as a publisher, uh, on the, your experience with the African novel, you know, your publishing, both, uh, you do traditional publishing, right? Yeah, I do traditional okay, yeah. publishing. And, and then we also do um, uh, publishing on contract, which, which is what Savad uh, mentioned. Um, yes. So, so I'll, I'll speak to all of those. So, so I mean, let, let's say that, um, yeah, as, as a marketing person, Savad, um, you, you, normally you don't, you, there are various uh, ways of classifying um, authors funding their, their publication. So there are, there are various interesting names. Um, the, the best I've heard, um, I mean, when it all started, it's uh, author-funded publishing. Um, in, in the West, there's some of them call it um, Vanity Press. Oh, uh, but, yes. yes. Okay. But, but, you know, the, the, the attitude towards that has changed a lot. And I'll tell you one of the businesses that made it quite hip, if you like, or quite mainstream, is Amazon. So Amazon created... Um, about 15 years ago, a company called Create Space. So with Create Space, you could actually have your publication. You could take it to, um, either you take it to Amazon. They, they had um, a group of editors and designers who could actually give you that same quality that you could get your book through a traditional publishing route and then have it um, put on their platform, which meant again that on a global scale you could have distribution. But what happened with with that, and even before that, with Vanity Press, is that mainstream uh, bookstores, uh, mainstream uh, book fairs, mainstream uh, uh, prizes were looking down on these um, works because of the um, then again um, of the perception. I'll use the word perception that they are low, low quality. I think DK has mentioned um, the, the issue of quality. But over the years, this model has been really, really well done by most uh, uh, um, uh, publishing houses. So I don't know about um, other countries, but I know about in, in Nigeria and in, in Ghana, and even in the UK and the US, there are people who are set up just to to um, sort of work with this model. And some do a hybrid. So I will tell you as a matter of fact that in most, um, mostly in Ghana and Nigeria where I have experience, um, most, except you are doing government textbooks straight out, but most publishing houses do those two models to be able to survive. Because the traditional publishing route alone does not give you enough revenue, especially when you are doing trade books. If you are doing textbooks and you can be able to print maybe 100,000, or if you are in Nigeria, you are able to do maybe 2 million copies, it is accepted for, for G, um, uh, WASI and stuff okay. like that, then you are making bucks. But if you are, and I'm, Amara, who is also a publisher, you see, I mean, if you are going into trade books, you are bringing out novels, you are bringing out books that people will read for pleasure. The traditional publishing route alone will sink you. It will disrupt. It, it will it will bankrupt you. Okay. So you you then also then you would also find people who have written fantastic um, uh, manuscripts, but because every publisher uh, has a, a limited kitty, and he would he would have some limitations on how many books 
that he can invest in, then somebody brings that manuscript and he can say that, you know what, it's a fantastic manuscript. I don't have the money to, to publish this. But if you are able to fund, especially the printing, the printing really is your big cost. You know, in terms of editing and stuff, sometimes you have in-house uh, staff who can do that. If you can fund it, um, we can come to an agreement. Um, I get this payment upfront. I do the printing, I give to you. I can even help you with the, with the distribution and stuff like that. So then, in a way, the, the same level of due diligence that goes into the work in terms of the editing phase, in terms of the design phase, in terms of the cover design, in terms of all the works, even with the distribution and the launch, there isn't much difference between a traditional publishing and um, where the author is funding it because you are using the same professional sort of standards. Mm -hmm. The problem comes when people just pick the book and then they go straight to a printer and then ask that the work is printed out for them because they are in a rush and all of that. That's uh -huh. where the problem comes. So mm -hmm. to come to back to your question, sweetie, we as Dakpabli, and uh, then that it is pronounced Dakpabli because it is made up of Damwa and Akpabli, who is my business partner. So it's a oh, combination okay. of our two names. So for us, we do both of them. We do the traditional uh, route where they have works. Maybe I, I think we have done about, since we started four years ago, we've done about 10 or 15 traditionally published books. Wow. And then there are other ones also that we have had, um, so we have, we've had to do it on contract. But the, the level of work in each of these uh, two categories doesn't differ. Actually, there are many people who have come to us that we have pushed back because they are too much in a hurry. We don't turn out a work in less than a year, for instance. You know, so you come to us and you, if you don't have patience to go through the process, you don't have patience to listen as we edit and sometimes we tear the manuscript apart, have yeah. you rewrite and all of that. If you don't have patience to go through the mail, for this um, number of months, then we don't even touch it at all. Because at the end of the process, when somebody goes into a bookstore and they are buying a book with our imprint on it, actually, you wouldn't know at that stage whether it was author founded or traditionally uh, published. So that's the that's the, the first thing about uh, that. So Sabah, don't be, don't be too, too surprised. <laughs> there are um, many more books out there. Actually now, there are a number of established authors who have been traditionally published who are going the author-funded route uh -huh. because they've also made their names. They've been accepted within the, the space also, but the author-funded route can give them more returns on their, on their works Royalty because there are some traditional yeah. publishers who haven't seen money even though their names are out there and mm. they are... They are as poor as church uh, rats, the previous church rats. I hear these days, especially in the church rats are very rich. Mm. So the other thing is about distribution. Indeed, we have a big problem with distribution. And I, with some friends, uh, Amara is involved with some colleagues uh, for about a year now, have been working together and talking together. We formed a consortium of uh, publishers and bookstores. We call ourselves Book, uh, Book Farm Africa where we are just looking at how well we can, we can distribute our books within ourselves across Africa, because our, mm -hmm. our distribution costs are still quite high, you know, so that's really a challenge um, between, uh, within West Africa, between Nigeria and Ghana, for instance, we used to be able to bring books down by road, but due to COVID and all the, the border closures, it's a headache. And if mm. you want to take it by air freighting, you realize that when the books land, the retail cost again becomes quite difficult for you to, 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 to push. So that is also a big issue uh, with, the, with the distribution. And then the final thing, Sabad mentioned the funding. Funding, is, funding comes when uh, 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 publishers can make it big, they can get back money uh, from, from what they, they, they are selling. And that's where I mentioned that that model between the traditional and the, the, the contract uh, publishing is what most publishers are using now to be able to make money from the contract so they can use it to fund the, the, the traditional publishing so they can again uh, get more books out there, you know, but it is, it is an egg and 
uh, chicken and egg situation all the time. And I think that over the past 10 years, there's been some good activity, at least within West Africa. I also know a bit about um, East Africa and the works uh, going on there. But yeah, it's, it's going to be a continuous uh, battle. Uh, we, we win a single, but uh, uh, we, we, win, we have single wins each day and we hope to continue on that trajectory. Oh. Thank you very much, Nana. That was really, 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 really profound. Um, yeah. There are lots of comments going like, hey, you're speaking for us. DK mentioned <laughs> it and Amara also mentioned it. Uh, so lots of challenges on the publishing front in, let's say more or less the non-Maghreb side, because uh, that's more of what you are talking about. Yes, that's what but, I know. Indeed, yes. But, uh, so to bring it back to the translating, to translation, so to say, uh, Savad, you've worked on, you work mainly on Arab text, yes? yes. You work on translating Arab text into English. Mm -hmm. Okay, or more or less uh, text written in Arabic because more or less they are written by Africans. So would you say there's any, um, would you say there's any difference in the works written by people in Arabic, that's Africans writing in Arabic and Arabic literature, on the other hand, that's, and this is me assuming that you're also conversant with Arabic literature. And I'm, um, though I've used the word literature, um, of course, more specifically novels now. So is there any difference between the two? Yeah, so generally in terms of quality, style, also um, the way that it's put together. Sorry, it's, like, it's, it's a good question. I've never <laughs> really considered it. In terms of quality or style, because the majority of the African sort of writers I'm working with, the only reason that sort of I'm aware of them or, you know, are able to... It's, it's a sort of chicken and egg situation. So when I'm looking for a book to translate, I always have to bring sort of like, a, you know, a whole a list of reasons to English language publishers as to why this book should be in English. And a lot of the times they want to see books which have won awards or which have received a lot of media presence or the author themselves has a huge following on Twitter or Instagram or obviously, you know, for marketing reasons. Um, and so as a result, the majority of the authors that I'm working with from the African continent who are writing in Arabic have published in the Middle East because that is where it's happening in terms of the awards are being given to, you know, the International Prize for Arabic Fiction, which is the equivalent of the man booker for the Arab world, which we call the Arab booker, you know, time after time, the, the publishing houses which are being shortlisted or which are winning the award are based in the Middle East. I'm yet to see a publisher of... Um, who is based on the African continent publishing in Arabic, who has even made that list. Uh, and so I think that speaks volumes in itself. So in terms of the quality of work, like aesthetically, as well as like the writing itself, I, I don't, I'm not really seeing much of a difference, but I guess what I would say is more perhaps, you know, characteristic of the writing I've generally seen by African authors writing in Arabic is for me, I found it more experimental, I guess, um, that there, there's, no, there's less fear of, of kind of going outside the lines of what is expected. Um, and that's what makes the works more engaging for me. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's very just a, a huge generalization I'm making here from works that I've read and been exposed to. But in my experience, that, that's what I would say, yeah. But as you were saying, I mean, we were both talking, we were all talking about earlier about how the West has a particular view of what the African novel should be. And that's very much the same thing about when I'm pitching these novels is that they want a sort of sweeping epic, which is, you know, covering the history and culture of, for example, this South Sudanese, uh, South Sudanese novel I'm doing. Um, like they don't want a science fiction novel, uh, you know, a, a Libyan science fiction novel, like they wouldn't want that. Um, yeah. It, they, they don't want something which is gen, genre like bending or that they can't easily categorize. It always has to be like performative 
of mm. African culture and history. And if it's not, then they're like, well, why would anybody read this? We, you know, you, you know, why should we waste time translating it? You could just read an author reading a writing in English who's, who's written like science fiction or something. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm up against that as well. The question I wanted to ask Nana was um, about if you're publishing any local languages like Tui or Ewe, or are you primarily focusing on English? And if so, like, why is that? Um, so I'm just curious, also just in general, so if you have any viewpoints on like publishing in other languages on the African continent, other than, you know, English, French, and Arabic, like, um, what, what is that like? Because uh, I think last year when we were on this, um, we had, a, I was on the panel for the Abuja Lit Fest, we had the South African writer and he was talking about um, sort of the lack of publishing infrastructure for, you know, languages like Tswana and Zulu and the rest in that writing in English really is sort of like a gateway to getting your work published. So I just wanted to talk about those sort of power dynamics and, and, and what your experiences have been, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, as a publishing house, as a publishing house, we've not done any lo local language yet. We've done one French novel. Remember, we are quite young, <laughs> just four years. We've done one French uh, novel, uh, um, which which was written directly in French, so not not translated from English at all. Okay. Um, yeah, but the, there are in Ghana the, the the local language space is quite active. We have um yeah we have an entire uh, bureau of um, Ghanaian languages, and I sell their books. I think I, I have listed about if I not mistaken about one hundred and fifty titles from them. You know so. The, the the space for for, for uh, publishing in in our local languages is is, is quite heavy um, and then also they are taught these are taught in in our basic school so um, and 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 they are adult learners um, we have we have churches that are that are conducted only in local languages so the local language space is quite active we have Bibles in major uh, local languages as well you know so so yeah, even though we've not published, there isn't there isn't um, lack lack of uh, local uh, language material to read, and there are people, there are some publishing houses who, who are just focused on on local language publications. Mm. Okay, uh, well, just to mention briefly, uh, the case in Nigeria is not that good. Um, mm -hmm. We don't really promote. Uh, indigenous publishing that much. So you find out that if there's any work that is published in a local language, largely out of, you find that most of those books are particularly who do their research, do, do whatever they do, they put the work together. Uh, and then you look for independent publishers, and uh, even though governments, uh, you know, state governments or the rest, trying to talk about um, promoting indigenous languages, they set, they say they are setting up a trust or this and that. It's largely tokenistic, and they do not translate to uh, practical things. So, in my state, for instance, Benue State, um, we've been told that okay, if you have such books. You bring them, they will be added to the curriculum. And like Nana said, most people try to get their books into the curriculum because that's where you sell the most. If your book is approved for the education, um, you know, for the curriculum or something for a secondary school, you find out that yes, people, lots of people would want to buy. But when you get this book out and you go to, you submit it for that inclusion, it actually might not make it. So there's been that uh, divide. So it's largely a labor of love. But um, there's a question for you, Savat, from DK. Uh, DK is asking, DK Chukumiride, a famous poet and awesome author, is asking, how do you counter that pressure on writers writing in Arabic to fit into the stere stereotypical narrative? Are there niche uh, markets for some of the more expressive and experimental writings these writers want to do? So that's a double fold double loaded question and it's there in writing in case you want to engage with it more yeah thank you dk for your question um or questions uh it's it's they're very good um i think the main issue wh when i'm working with 
these authors is, is funding. Um, all of the countries where they're hailing from, there's no funding to support their works. Um, even for Arabic in general, for translation into English, the only funding which is currently available is from the Sheikh Zayed sort of funding body based in the Emirates, which will only give funding for books which have been long listed or short listed for their prize, which again relies on distribution, right? Um, for, for the book being in certain, you know, uh, markets in order to, to be considered uh, for the prize. So in terms of countering the pressure, unfortunately, all I've been doing is I have to try to build a sort of following around these writers from the ground up. And the way I do that is by translating excerpts and placing it in small magazines and then, you know, giving interviews about these writers. So because a lot of them don't speak English. So I'm kind of, you know, creating the sort of around their works and then um the only sort of funding body that i've been able to apply to but at the same time which is you know available for anybody based in the uk working from any language into english which means the odds are very slim of you getting this funding is the english pen uh you know funding body which you have to find a uk publisher first and then you can apply for the funding um so for example with Najwa bin Shatwan, her short story collection, which is called Catalog of a Private Life, which is coming out with Daedalus books in uh, this November. They have a specific Africa list uh, that's funded by English Pen. Uh, but to give you an example, you know, her it's it's a very sort of um, dark humor, um, absurdist uh, short story collection, which does not explicitly state Libya as the backdrop. So it could have been written in any country. And um, there's also a lot of like speculative, you know, sort of stories in it. Um, nobody wanted this collection. A lot of her writing is like this. Um, and another short story collection of hers I've been pitching, I've pitched it to over 25 houses as of date. And everyone has said, you know, oh yeah, we love the writing, but we just don't know where this falls. Like, how would we, how would we sell it? Um, so what I've ended up doing, aside from applying for, you know, this English pen funding when I, when, like, you know, and if I am awarded it, is um, I start with publishers with a book I know that they feel comfortable with. So, for example, the Stella Gatano book, uh, which is called Edo Souls, which will be out hopefully next summer, um, is more of a traditional sort of book that they would want. And after then, hopefully, you know, they would make some money from that book. I can pitch something a little less... Um, how shall I say generic um although having said that I mean like you know Stella's book is beautiful and 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 I love it which is why you know as uh so Edie said a lot of the work you know as as any writer or poet does is or translator is a labor of love I mean I'm not making the big bucks here so uh yeah I mean I just usually try to gain the trust of the publisher by giving them a book that I that I like that I also think will sell well and then hopefully afterwards I can bring them something which perhaps is a little bit outside of their comfort zone and then they, once we have established that trust, then they can, you know, perhaps take a chance on that. But uh, yeah, that's basically, I mean, unfortunately, there's no other way around it. Um, it's not like, you know, language, people translating from French um, have so much uh, funding from like, you know, um, the French government gives so much money for translations from French into English, as does the German government. Like there's so many Goethe Institute, like, you know, um, sort of uh, grants you can apply for. But whereas, you know, translators working from Arabic, whether you're working with authors from the Middle East or the African continent, you're just, it's really difficult to find any sort of funding. And I've had even authors say, you know, that they would do sort of crowdfunding and they can pay me via that way. But I just feel so guilty taking their money because it's, it's kind of like, you know, they're not, again, it's all just sort of a labor of love. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just a sort of difficult situation. Yeah, so unfortunately, no, there aren't any niche markets. And I just end up doing a lot of short pieces. Um, yeah, like uh, Najwa bin Shatwan's just uh, to end oh, on yeah. this. Oh, sorry, um, short story, which is now coming out with a, um, so she was long listed for the short story Africa Day Prize, which they've come out with an anthology called Disruption. So um, she's included in that anthology, but that's pretty much as far as like, uh, you know, that sort of work would go. It's very unusual um, and uh, talks, you know, about um, sort of speculative fiction con co combined with environmental like uh, concerns. So yeah, it's a very long winded uh, 
question, the answer to your question, but hopefully it made some sense. That's good. Yes, I'm sure it did. It made a lot of sense to me. Um, <laughs> well, DK says thank you very much. Uh, Nana, you are going to say something. Yes, I, w I wanted to, I mean, Savad is uh, opening up a lot of interesting things for me. And I, the, <laughs> I the, love the listening thing, to you, yeah. <laughs> the thing with me is that my ears pick up on words, on keywords. So I, I've just been dropping the keywords as she spoke. You know, she mentioned the experimental. And I like that, you know, that is really the, the problem we have when, when publishers look to commercial value of, of works alone, you know. And, and so then um, we don't have authors experimenting. And I tell people as a bookseller that in terms of African, the things that Afri African literature can explore. So that's why I don't like those categorizations. I don't like those tags. What is African literature? I mean, there is, we don't have, we don't, we've not written up enough about um, Africans in, in hospitals. We've not written enough about even African witchcraft, uh, you know, more than African witchcraft in, 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 uh, in stories. What is, what is um, uh, Harry Potter series? Uh, Swedi, haven't we had this rich craft in this place for so long? Oh, yes, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How have we even marketed it? You know, oh. um, I mean, about Africans going underwater, underwater fiction, even the types of biographies that we can have, you know, and all of that. So we have, we, we have so much to explore. But because okay. of the, the commercialization of stuff, we have a very parochial, narrow focus. You know, so I'm really, really praying that we African publishers will have enough money that we can put enough aside for experiment, uh, experimental literature. So we can have people exploring so that Savard in herself doesn't really have to think about finding exciting work to translate because we are not just looking at what we can sell, but we can look at, we are also looking at what we can contribute to the body of knowledge for, for the continent, you know. Again, she mentioned categorization, which for me always limits. So I tell when people are writing, I mean, young writers come to me and say, um, what type of journal should I be working on? I say, don't think about that. As a, as a creative, when I am writing, I don't think about categorization. Actually, in my fiction writing, I mix all sorts of, of, all sorts of styles. I put storytelling in there. Sometimes I move to poetry. Sometimes you see me expressing in my local language. Sometimes translation, uh, transliteration. When I am done at a, as a creative, I leave it to the academicians to do the categorization. That is their job, you know. Uh -huh. That is their uh -huh. work. I'm a creative. I should feel free to just express uh, myself. So these are the works, and uh, these are the thoughts I wanted to add to those fantastic keywords that came from, from Savard, but it just threw my mind uh, somewhere else. But the more we need, that's why we need big, big, big pocket uh, um, African publishers. So we can just go out there. Lots of people are experimenting a lot. You come to Ghana, so many young people are expressing themselves. They are putting up works up and, up and down. I mean, we just don't have enough money to, to publish them all. I mean, if I tell you the number of people who come to us every day that we have to either refer mm -hmm. to other people and, and stuff like that, it would, it would amaze you. But people are really writing out there. But because of all this focus on commercialization and even focus on what can go into, into text, what can go into curriculum, we are not expressing ourselves. Let me finalize by saying on this point, I've been telling people, can you imagine, Ghana is about 30 million people. I tell them, can you imagine one, um, 10 million people each year buying only one book. Look at Nigeria. Um, you, you guys, your, your population census, I never believe, but I, I think you are, you are getting close to 300 billion. But you look, look, at, look at, say, 30 million Nigerians buying one book alone each year, not for academics, but to read for pleasure. Think about what it will do for the, the industry. And so we need to write more and express more, especially for these young people 
whose minds are always exploring, we need to find text that would excite them that they can read and explore and read for pleasure. That is the focus we should have as an industry. If we can get these people, if we can get uh, publishers investing in what Sabat calls experimental uh, literature, and th this is what would appeal to, to these young people, we can be making good bucks in the trade market, not in textbooks. But for now, we have become so too parochial with our, with our, our focus and uh, constrained by what Sabat said, not being able, so most of our work now is really working for, for the love of it, you know, but uh -huh. that love should be supported by this sort of focus. And even those like Sabat who are working for love can get paid for their love. You know, love must be, must pay. <laughs> love should be fed, indeed. Exactly. So it doesn't yeah. need us to simply just die out of starvation. Yes, exactly. makes total sense. So um, I think this at this point, if anybody has any question uh, that they would like to ask, you can just uh, indicate, you know, use any icon to show uh, you need to, you want to uh, talk, or you can type into the chat box. I, DK's hand seems to be up. DK, would you like to say something? Sorry, that must have been a mistake. Um, I'm sorry, my hand wasn't up. <laughs> well, your hand is still up. We can see the white hand. <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, but now we've spoken of the ideal, Nana, of what we would want to see, what should happen. But to make it practical now, you know, being the bookseller that you are, what um what what are the figures like for the african novel that's um you know with your sales and the rest what are the figures and if they are selling as i believe they are which particular books are selling and why do you think they are selling okay so first of all i i have tried to engineer the change i want you know so when when you come to our website for instance um we we are talking and amara will tell you i mean we're talking maybe about 80 percent of african literature um and this from last two years actually from last year what i started doing with the business is to reach out to like i was telling you reach out to this community of african publishers and try to get books actively actively from other countries so uh, we've, I mean, obviously Nigeria is uh, next door, so we have lots, lots of books from from Nigeria. We reached out to Rwanda. We have books from South Africa. We've had books from um, Nairobi. Um, you know, uh, yeah. So we're, we're building on 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 that. So I mean, when it comes to our bookstore, our best-selling books, first of all, are children's books, and again, it surprises lots of people the range of children's books that we have. Because if you go to a typical bookstore in Ghana or in Nigeria, it's funny, you find an African section. <laughs> you know, in our, in our bookstore, the foreign books section is actually smaller. So we've been actively building on African books for children. So that's really our, our, our fastest selling category, children's books and 90% of these uh, by by African writers, a lot of Ghanaian um, children's books. The range is is uh, mind um, uh, blowing. The second category where we sell a lot is biographies. So you realize or, already that I don't do I, we don't do a lot of non trade books. Actually, it was only late last year that we we went into into test books for for a new curriculum that Ghana had just introduced. So we have the the uh, biographies as uh, the the second. Um, category with sales. Um, closely followed by that, maybe joint would be political books and history books. You know, so we have books about uh, history, about West African history, um, history about the political process. Uh, 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 so some historical, biographical uh, books as well by, by leaders, by Gowan, by uh, Obasanjo, by Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, our, our some of our late leaders. So those books also do well uh, on, on our bookstore. I think that perhaps then I'll go to the fifth 
the fifth one would which would then be the, the novels so and the novels really come down uh, in terms of uh, this is fiction and, and again these are led by by african african fiction so um books by chimamanda um african um, um uh, so this is let me say literary fiction um so books by chimamanda books from from publishers like uh, amara like um cassava republic um uh, big big uh, publishers in in ghana who are into into these novels and then uh, i think the last category i would mention would be young adult fiction so we okay. have yeah long a uh, young adult fiction also does very well uh, because again because of my own advocacy over the last 10 years or so where we've been pushing for people to read for pleasure so there are people who reach out to me and who say that you know, the children are home um, i have 200 Ghana cities can you do a package of books that they can read and i had a lot of those during the, the lockdown again where people say the children are home uh, for holidays now or they are home they are they are spending so much time on their phone can i can you get us some books um i said then i'll ask them what is the age range and then we can create a package and give to them so these are my top uh, uh, ranges um, so children's books are across um you have then from um, to to um biographies then historical um uh, books and political history and then um, literary fiction or contemporary fiction and then the sixth one i would mention uh, would be um, young adult uh, fiction and then finally maybe just across uh, people we try to also especially for the adults we try to get them books that bring nostalgia so books like Tintin, Asterix, the African Writer Series. Uh, this year I've sold a lot of the African, the African Writer Series, the old titles. Um, so, you know, those, those classics, you know, uh, we try to get those classics also to excite the young people, because it, the, the adults, because I, I tell people that um, the children, they, they, they mimic what the adults do. So if you're a parent and you want your child to read, you must be caught reading. So we try to get the, the adults reading as well, so the children can can get good models to follow. Ah, yeah, I see. Sava says the, the the husband has those. They are, they are classics. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good series. It's unfortunate that it doesn't. They don't seem to be really doing much anymore. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. they don't. They they actually left. Uh, Henneman stopped producing them actively. So there there are few titles still in circulation. And uh, yeah, we need more. I mean, that's exactly so. For this particular one, I actually get excited when I see some from from um, uh, Northern Africa. I have I maybe about five or so. They are always exciting to have them uh, to to add up to the pack. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, uh, speaking about this, you know, there's this tradition that was built. You know, the African Writer Series. Yes. Um, is there a way, perhaps, that we can bring back such traditions? Yes. And saying this now, um, I'm referring not just to the English, uh, the the Western part of it, that's the West African or East African part, but also to the Northern African part. Um, how can this be done? What can we do about it? And in saying this, I'm also extending the question to you, Savad. What do you think can be done? So um, maybe Nana would come first, then Savad would go after that. Sure. No, we, we, we need to continue talking. Um, we need to continue talking because, I mean, if, if you want something like that, it, it was done in a Pan-African way. So we need to have publishers collaborating um, because, uh, so for instance, you could divide Africa into the four um, uh, aspects that we have the Western Africa, Northern Africa, um, Eastern Africa, Western Africa. So we can have, um, you know, focus points in all of these areas. And then you can imagine easily with, say, I mean, let me talk West Africa, for instance. So I can have uh, maybe some couple of fantastic titles that I can contribute into the series. Amara can have that. Uh, Igosa from narratives can have that uh, narrative. Uh, you know, um, uh, Cassava Republic can have that. So then we can have a pool. Then once we have that pool, 
we collaborate and publish in Africa, uh, West Africa, but then we sell the rights. Remember, we have to go over the challenge of distribution, but then we yeah, yeah. sell the rights to somebody sitting in uh, North Africa, maybe Sabad is coordinating that. And then she also with her team have uh, a group of uh, Northern African writers whose works can then be published there and also the rights given to, to the uh, West African uh, cohort that we can do that. So I mean, we can, we can do that very, 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 very easily. Actually, we've, we've still been talking over the past year, for instance, and this is something that I need to share with, with uh, the uh, Book Farm team, for instance. We are looking, for instance, at having a cluster of uh, print on demand uh, 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 printers, you know, so that once we build trust, uh -huh. I sit here, uh -huh. I, have, I have titles, I can give them to um, Savat, uh, sitting in, uh, in, in North Africa with, with a, a book, uh, print on demand seller there so we, we create demand across the continent and then we can uh -huh. print in all these clusters and 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 do it but the, the key thing is what amar has mentioned and she knows is something i'm i'm very passionate about collaboration we We're need to start talking yeah. to each other we need to collaborate no one can co um, conquer the continent alone it's too big cool. yeah there's enough meat to share from all parts to tear this part tear exactly. that part <laughs> All right, uh, Sarah, please. Yeah, it's definitely, I think, what Nana has been saying in terms of um, opening the lines of communication. And I feel personally, I've been guilty of this is like waiting for the like Western publishing houses to do something, um, you know, for various projects in terms of bringing Arabic into English. But as he was saying, like in terms of just taking the reins, you know, um, on our own, like why do we need to wait for other people to revive the series? Um, it's really like a beloved series for so many people. Um, and oh, I yeah. think it was curate. The, the key thing is the curation of it. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, as he said, you could do print on demand. And once you've earned readers mm -hmm. trust, then they would be looking forward to the next installment in the series. Um, but uh, just because, for example, I know like I've been in touch with um, editors from Penguin and they they are painfully aware that on their classics list, you know, they have very few African writers like um, mm. they had done this presentation at the British Library where they had a map of the world up and they had shown where all like the, their writers were because, you know, the classic series has been around for, I think, over mm -hmm. at least, uh, 80 to 100 years or so. And they, people were just asking, well, like, where, where, why don't you have more African writers? And they were just like, oh, like, we're working on it, right? Like, you know, but having said that, when you pitch something to them, which I have done, then it still doesn't fit in, in what they're looking for. So, um, but why do we need it to be like, you know, rubber stamped by Penguin to say that yes. this is an African author that you should be reading? Um, Indeed. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to see the similarities in the sense, whether it's written in English or in Arabic, that the authors, whether they're writing in English or Arabic from the African continent are having to get that approval from outside in order to gain the readers on the continent, which, you know, unfortunately, like it, it needs to change. Yeah. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, we are drawing to an end. Uh, our session is meant to finish for 5.30. So just to mention again that if anybody has any question, please, you can either type them or if you raise your hand, if you show any sign, if I see any symbol across, uh, <laughs> we can give you the chance to talk. But um, still moving forward, uh, Nana. Um, Speaking of collaboration now, uh, how much more collab because several people have been collaborating and you've mentioned the book farm uh, group, which you helped to curate with Amara, which I am a part of, um, except these, what other um, notable collaborations are there on the continent to promote the African novel that you would like to tell us about? So that, I mean, we can key into, I mean, people listening can key into you know, the, the thing about me is that I, I don't like swallowing elephants. I, <laughs> I, like, I like to take bits, bites, uh, bit pieces at, at, at a time. You know, our, our, our problems are not a lot. 
it is our lack of uh, going to the solutions, you know. So, so that's why our our problems seem to to repeat themselves. Um, I, so really, it is about it is about um, that one of the key things about trust is is about uh, trusting each other. It's about that ability to trust and open up um, and to, and to share works. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that trust leads to what Sava just mentioned about about piracy, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, but Sava, Sava, but my my problem, my solution to uh, uh, pir uh, piracy is quite simple. I I worked in the in a manufacturing environment, um, uh, what we call the fast moving goods uh, environments, where one of the biggest problems we had were were with uh, counterfeits, huh. where people were counterfeiting. Uh, uh, products and and so um, you always have to go fight against them. And my attitude towards counterfeiting is simple. I, I say that what is the root cause of counterfeiting? It's because people, uh, first of all, they don't get the products to buy the real ones, and then perhaps when they get the real products to buy, it is too expensive. So two things: get the products available all the time from the right source and try to beat down your, your cost. If you're able to do these two things, you, you realize quickly that counterfeiters are not able to, to thrive because they, they thrive where there is scarcity and then they try to fill uh, the, 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 the scarcity. But and, and all of this is really the, the issue of, of, of trust. If um, So three things, if you are trusting and you are able to then uh, share works and you're able to have those contracts um, signed and respected and uh, reports generated and there is transparency uh -huh. and everything is going well. I think that we can we can do much more. We can collaborate much more. We can distribute our works much more. We can trust that if I'm giving my works to Amara in, in, uh, or, or Swede in Nigeria, he his, whatever report is given to me is as is because there are, are counter uh, balances that we can do. Uh, we can put in place to do that, you know. So, I mean, my, my solutions are not a lot all the time, uh, Swedi. I'm an engineer. I, I like to keep things simple and and and, and focus and, and and drive deeper, you know. Yeah. Okay, makes a lot of sense. And uh, Savad, we are drawing to uh, an end. Uh, so, I think the key question I would ask now is. What more would you want to see with the African novel? And also, what uh, word would you like to give to translators and people who are interested in translation generally? So, sorry, just to clarify, the second question is like in terms of advice for translators or people interested in translation, or? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, OK. And then the first one is, what would I like to see happen with the African novel? Uh -huh. um, specifically, as I mentioned, like talking from the African novel written in Arabic, I would want, I guess, I think I would want more people to take an interest in terms of readers reading in Arabic, but I think that's not happening because they're not getting the books. Um, you know, I think the, the stories are there, but they're not selling as well because they're not, you know, as we mentioned, um, oh, there's a question. Okay. But um, the distribution is not there. So, you know, even for me in the sphere that I'm working in as a translator, um, there's very few translators who are translating from Arabic into English who are bringing our cost works from the African continent. Um, and that's something that I would want to encourage more translators to do, uh, you know, whether it's from French or, you know, Arabic or another language. In terms of translation, if there's, you know, somebody who's interested in getting into translation, I would say you could reach out to me on Twitter and I'm happy to like speak to people one-on-one -on -one to give some advice. I mean, it's it's a lovely uh, sort of space to be in. It's very collaborative and encouraging, but I mean, to be up front, you're working from one of the more major languages such as, you know, German or French, like there's not a lot of money in it. Um, so, you know, I do have a day job uh, and I translate on the side, but um, yeah, I just, the key thing for me, it always comes down to funding. 
Um, I just yeah. feel like there's not enough money being put into these books. And so a lot of them are just falling through, through the cracks, unfortunately. Yeah. And it, it's a real, it's a real shame. Yeah. So there are two questions, a uh, dog borrowed question that Nana has put in for you uh, in the chat box. What do we need to get more books from Northern Africa across the continent for us to enjoy? And two, what are the challenges in getting books out from your region to the rest of the continent? To get more books from Northern Africa across the continent for us to enjoy. I think, as you mentioned earlier, Nana, it's issue of trust. I think that perhaps publishers working in, you know, Northern Africa don't have those relationships of trust of a uh, publisher. Like there's no established relationship with publishers in Western Africa or even Eastern or Southern or Central. Everyone's just kind of working in their own silos um, and, and, and not seeing what a huge sort of readership is there just hungry for these books. Um, and yeah, maybe in the beginning, there might be a loss of profit, but I think in, in the long run, there's, there's a lot of money to be made by tapping into this, you know, market, especially the, the average age, uh, you know, across the continent is so young. I mean, there's people who, you know, who want to read, who, who, who would love to read. Uh, so yeah, I think the challenge is in getting books, you know, to the rest of the continent is the same thing as distribution. Um, Interestingly enough, I think it mirrors like the issue of even just traveling across the continent, you know. Um, so my husband is Ghanaian and so I've been to Ghana a number of times and, and I used to work in South Africa and just traveling across the continent is so exorbitantly expensive. Like, I mean, yeah. um, so I can imagine as you were talking about transferring just books. I mean, if you can't even like get people across, how are we going to get books across? Indeed. There's so so many things that need to be, um, you know, just revisited and broken down in terms of going across borders and perhaps more sort of agreements being made between countries. But I think, uh, you know, I'm not sure, perhaps you can um, enlighten me what it was like historically, if it was always this difficult to travel mm -hmm. um, across the continent from north to south or east to west, uh, because it seems easier to go to Europe or America than to go uh -huh. to another country on the continent, um, yeah. whether it's due to expense or visas. I mean, I know about ECOWAS, but like even if you're just going, you know, through Morocco to go somewhere else, it's just, it's just, it's, yeah. I mean, there's so, I, I'm just going to end there. I'm just a bit, um, mm. uh, how should I say, like pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, in to, to answer your question very quickly in terms of the, the cost basis, it's, it's an issue of volume. Yeah. It's an issue of volume of, of, of movements and volume of trade, you know. So the, things go and uh, people, items, uh, passengers move a lot um, towards Europe than between the, 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 the continent, you know. So, um, yeah. That's, that's really the, 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 the problem. That's why, for instance, um, before these border closures, it was much easier to move things by road between Ghana oh. and, Nigeria. and Nigeria. Because there's a lot of yeah. trade between Ghana and Nigeria, even uh, more than between Ghana and Benin or, or uh, Nigeria and Togo. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just an issue of the volume. So, I mean, I, I send books um, across by DHL and I like to track, I like to track the, the movement of the book. So I sent something to Mozambique one day. It went through, I think I left Accra, it went to Lagos, and then it went to Belgium, it went to Germany, it Whoa. went to South Africa, and then it came down to Mozambique. <laughs> so that's a, yes, if you want to send something from Ghana to Sierra Leone, it goes from Ghana to Cote d'Ivoire, and then from Cote d'Ivoire to I think think um, Liberia before it goes to Sierra Leone. Yo, wow. Yes. You know, so, so I mean, um, we, we want to see what after, after will bring to us uh, in terms of the, 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 the uh -huh. one, one, um, one trading unit. But you know, the, the thing, especially by road, that uh, uh, my Nigerian colleagues will, will tell you, if you travel by road, those, those uh, customs and immigration services, they don't know this ECOWAS protocol. <laughs> <laughs> He said, Echo, as what animal is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, but well, so, I, li I like these challenges. Uh, 
I like this challenge uh, because I always say that it is us who must solve them. So as we put the challenges up, up front, then we know that it is nobody is going to build this continent for us. We are the ones who are going to make it work. Okay. So um, Samad gave us her closing shot. Would you like to just give us your own closing shot? I think I just did that. Okay. All of these challenges, all of these publishing things that we have said, we need to start yeah. to continue talking. We need to continue working, not giving, losing hope. We need to continue Indeed. collaboration. And I think that hopefully our children will not be using the same language as we are using in terms of complaining. Uh, they will be building on what we have built for them. And Savad, it's great to know that you are half Ghanaian. <laughs> <laughs> I like that bit. <laughs> Yes. Please yeah. link up anytime you come. Okay, I think that. Definitely. <laughs> okay, so uh, my dad's the first place to put it on a place of hope and can novel and literature in general, but also for our continent. I think as long as we keep giving our best and building bridges across the continent, collaborating, we will definitely get a better tomorrow to help us God. So over to you, Nyinye. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Savard. Thank you very much, Nana. It has been a very, 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 very superlatively interesting and exciting panel. I had mixed feelings starting this, but it has blown my mind and gone beyond <laughs> what I had expected. So thank you very much to both of you. Hopefully we would uh, continue with this conversation on Twitter, on Facebook, and other places. Let's see if we can link up again to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. To ALS and to everybody else who has given us this platform and to everyone who is here too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Savad. Thank you, Nana. Thank you very much, Suede. Great moderation, great talks, very insightful. Um, we're going to have another um, session, although that will be physical after. So I encourage everyone to also, you know, participate in that. And as Suede said, to keep the conversation going, because, you know, it's when we talk and when we rub minds on these things that we can actually affect real change. So thank you, everyone, for this once more and have a great day. All right. Bye. Bye bye.